From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Noel will not be joining us today, but he is here in spirit. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deck. And most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Before we do our usual check-in, we have a uh, special announcement. Happy birthday, Mike. Yeah, Mr. Mike Wolf. We're belated. Uh, I believe your birthday was Tuesday. It was yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but hey, Mike is 24 today, everybody. It's pretty (laughs) awesome. Uh, Kelly says hi, and uh, hey, uh, let's get on with the show. But happy birthday, Mike. Yeah, nice cooler. Good to be back, man. Long time. Yeah, I know. It's been an entire week and some since I've seen you, especially since we've been in the studio together. And, mm. you know, I cherish these times. Likewise. And, and we are, uh, we're coming to the end of the big birthday month here at HowStuffWorks slash iHeart Podcast Network, mm-hmm. where so many of us were born around this time. And just as a check-in, just want to let you know that I got to karaoke for the first time in a long time. That's cause, right. Yeah, because it was Annie's birthday. And I did this thing that I thought you would have been proud of of, but mm-hmm. since you were away on an adventure, you didn't get to witness it. Um, I attempted to do Hip to be Square, you know, by Huey Lewis in the News, mm-hmm. and then there's an instrumental section that occurs in that song, and I had prepared, uh, essentially, it's not fully a monologue, but the dialogue from one of the characters in American Psycho, where he's discussing Huey Lewis in the News, and I was I was going to perform it during the instrumental section. Oh, cool. Now... Let me just uh, also say this because Mission Control was there too. Mission Control was rocking out to some Britney Spears, to some classic uh, new metal, all kinds of really great songs. (laughs) Everybody was feeling it. It was a packed room. Mm -hmm. And I got up to start doing mine and it felt like not a single person in the room even knew what the song was or at least didn't care. So I turn around at one point. Just to be like, all right, guys, we do it. Does anybody understand what this song is or where it comes from? Mm-hmm. Crickets. So uh, it's real embarrassing. Now you're talking about, I believe, the moment in the film adaptation of American Psycho where Christian Bale's character begins a- at an increasingly manic clip. Yeah. Uh, sort of describing his uh, his his criticism of Huey Lewis in the news. Right? Well, and also about how they've evolved, mm-hmm. about how this this album in particular with this song on it, mm-hmm. uh, it it's showing this consummate professionalism and all of these things, and about uh, critiques of the song itself and the meaning behind it. And this is as he's amping himself up to commit a murder, <laughs> yes. is this correct? Yes. I think that's brilliant. I well re- done. Thanks, man. I really thought you would have liked it. That's, that's okay. But uh, hey, you weren't there because you were on an adventure. And also, late happy anniversary to you, my friend. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And and likewise, because uh, you and Annie and Noel and our own Casey Pegram. And all, Tyler. And Tyler Klang. Uh, and, and more. We're missing someone. Chandler is like almost in the club. Chandler's debatable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But <laughs> uh, but we do have quite a few August birthdays. Uh, circumstances found me, you, you know, I hate to miss any recording of this show, but circumstances found me in Japan, a uh, place where that mission control is very familiar with. Uh, so what do you think about meandering intros? Sorry about that. Let us know. Uh, you can reach <laughs> us directly. We are one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Leave us a message. Tell us about specifically that intro and and ask us about Ben's crow story when, when he was in a different place. Oh, wow. Uh, because he, hopefully he'll tell that one too. It's a great story. Uh, that's very kind, Matt. Yeah, I, I'm coming in hot. My body doesn't know what time it is. I have a vague awareness that it is probably a Monday here. Yeah. Your Um, body is just a cage, my friend, for the mm -hmm. words you're about to say. (laughs) That's true. Uh, Camaras, right? Uh, Not not Camaros. uh, (laughs) Camara, C H I M E R A. This this is an interesting 
fascinating and, as we will learn today, disturbing concept. Really, it, the best way to approach this is to ask ourselves, what's the line between humans and other animals, mm. right? Because technically, if we cast, if, if we put all uh, the metaphysical stuff and the spirituality and the religious stuff aside, biologically speaking, human beings are defined as animals. So what makes us different? For a long, long time, we thought uh, humans have souls. And that's still what people will say, but again, that's that's more of a spiritual, uh, religious reasoning. Not really provable yet. Not really provable yet. True. Uh, when we looked at something more secular for centuries and centuries, we said, well, the big difference between humans and all other animals would be intelligence. The problem is, even now, our species has a real difficult time defining intelligence. And the more we examine this line between humans and other animals, the more we see that this line fuzzes, right? The, the demarcation is not as stark as we would wish. Well, yeah, because there are plenty of non-human animals that display all sorts of intelligence. Crows. <laughs> yeah, crow, absolutely. Crow cetaceans mm. to be some of the most – uh, prominent ones in elephants. Elephants. Uh, what are octopus and cephalopods? Cephalopods. Yeah. Yeah. All all kinds of different animals mm. show some form of at least a, a, an an awareness beyond what we would usually contribute to an animal. Right. Right. Uh, sapience, sentience, wisdom. For years, and you remember this, Matt. Uh, for years, various organizations around the world have said, you know what, some of these animals, the ones we just named, are in fact so intelligent that they meet the legal threshold of personhood, meaning that their cognitive abilities are high enough that they should be guaranteed some of the same rights that we, our species, in theory, gives to every other human being. And today's episode approaches that, that same weird border. What is the line between human and animal? animal. And what happens when those lines even get even further blurred? Mm -hmm. And where does it take us? Here are the facts. You've probably heard the word chimera before. The definition of chimera is, is pretty cool. In folklore, it's a very strange flex. In mythology, specifically Greek mythology, the chimera is this fire-breathing monster. It's female. And it's this strange anatomical mixtape. It's mostly a lion, right? Mm -hmm. At least in the front. It is a goat in the middle, and it has a goat head coming out of the back, yeah. sort of the mid-spine. And then it's a dragon in the rear. The, yeah. Yeah, right? I, I know most of my chimeras from Magic the Gathering. Uh -huh. I, I mean, as well as Greek mythology. Sure. But MTG has some – some pretty great ones. And they have some divergent takes, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you take the Spellheart Chimera, that was a big one for me back in mm -hmm. the day. I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk no, about this. No, I, I want to hear. What, <laughs> no, not, please. Uh, there, a lot of them, at least the card art and the way they're described in the flavor text is very similar to the uh, traditional Greek mythology versions. Mm -hmm. So like three or more usually distinct animals melded into a single creature. Sometimes it gets down into, you know, two fully separate heads. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just one head with a body that's a little different. But it's always a melding of creatures. Right, right. And – Interestingly enough, in Greek mythology, the chimera is the child of Typhon and Echidna, and it is also a sibling of other multi-headed creatures such as Cerebus, the three-headed canine that guards the underworld, and the Hydra. Oh, yeah. That's – I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. It makes uh, – it, it doesn't make perfect sense, but it makes better sense – to have that be the mythological order of uh, of what is it uh, child monsters <laughs> baby birth uh, monster birth <laughs> right. uh, to, for those to actually have this and this it's strange because again we see the intersection between folklore mythology and modern fact you know a lot of our nomenclature and terminology comes from these ancient stories and that's why the word chimera still exists. Here, in these, our modern days, we have a scientific definition of chimera. 
Oh, yeah. So if you look to science, it's going to say a chimera is a single organism, one distinct thing that's composed of two or more distinct different populations, and this is important, of cells that originated from different zygotes involved in sexual reproduction. So this is, this is highly important for today's episode. Mm. Two very specific sets of cells from, uh, from two different zygotes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is huge. This is crucial. So far from the lion, goat, dragon uh, street hit of ancient mythology, actual chimeras are more subtle. At least yeah. the ones that you may have met sometime in your life. Not only have you may have met them, but you may have – never noticed anything different about them. Chimera can occur naturally in humans. So let's say that you or your loved one are carrying a child and there are two two kids in the womb, fetuses, right? Not yeah. not quite, you know, kids, but but fetuses that will become human beings. And one of the fetuses dies or is absorbed by its twin, leaving the surviving fetus with two distinct sets of cells. Whoa. So like identical twins maybe doesn't matter as much, but fraternal twins, this does matter. Genetically, they are different. And, and it's hard to really comprehend what that means unless you apply it to uh, a story or an example. Exactly, exactly. So usually not only would you not know the person you met is a chimera, they probably don't know either. And typically, people find out about this by accident. In 2002, there was a woman named Karen Keegan. Karen Keegan needed a kidney transplant, and so she underwent genetic testing to see whether one of her family members could be a potential donor. This is clear standard operating procedure. You check with the family first, right, in mm -hmm. this situation. They did conduct the test, and what they found um, – they, they found something that completely caught them off guard, something they were not looking for. Yeah, sometimes you'll hear, no, you're not the father, but you know what you never hear? No, you are not the mother. Uh, see, the, the genetic testing that Karen and her family underwent indicated that, technically speaking, she could not be the mother of her children, that she birthed. That she birthed, yes, her <laughs> biological children. This threw everyone for a loop. It was like the end of usual suspects. What's going on here? The doctors eventually learned that Karen, in fact, was a human chimera. Uh, this, this is just one example. And they probably would never have caught this uh, unless that kidney transplant need came up. Bone marrow transplants can also create chimera. Uh, Bone marrow transplants, by the way, are really interesting. There are a couple of unidentified people who were more or less cured of HIV by bone marrow transplants. In this case, you don't need to have something freakish happen. Bone marrow contains the cells that later develop into red blood cells. Right? Ye old stem cells. Ye old stem cells. Ye old stem cell. Uh, so – what happens when someone has a bone marrow transplant is that their own bone marrow is destroyed somehow and it's replaced with marrow from this donor. And this marrow, this stranger's marrow, creates these new blood cells. They continually are created. And that means that if you receive a successful bone marrow transplant for the rest of your natural life, you will carry genetically distinct cells within your body that reproduce. You will become a chimera. Wow. I've never thought of it that way. I didn't – I had no idea. I haven't thought about it that way because I guess you and I have been fortunate enough in our lives uh, to not have to – delve into bone marrow transplants. True, so very far. true, very yeah. true. We've been very fortunate. But, you know, when you're thinking about it in this way, it's in that particular example, it's a very good thing. Like being a chimera is, is great. You've got the, the blood of someone else essentially in your body because they helped you survive or they helped you, helped you continue on, right? Yeah. A chimera in this way 
in a scientific way, just isn't scary. It, at least it's not nearly as uh, creepy as the Greek mythology monsters that existed because of this word or this word was used to describe. Yeah, it's much it's it's much um it's much more inspirational. Yes. Really. It's like, it really is. Look at us humans, go medicine, uh go science. They yeah, these chimera don't seem near as frightening. You wouldn't notice it. And here's another thing. While we we're talking about pregnancy, mm-hmm. for a time, there's a study from, I want to say, 2015 or so, uh, that indicates women during pregnancy may function as chimera for oh, for a limited amount of time. Because the fetus is creating its it's developing its own cells and blood and everything is being shared mm-hmm. in that one symbiotic yeah. system. So and, it goes back to fetal cells. Yeah. Oh wow. But oh you know what that makes yeah. dude that makes total sense. Uh-huh. Um my wife and I had had all these discussions. She was learning a lot during our pregnancy, but how uh the hormones in her body as well as having this you know, this being existing inside of her that she's sharing fluids with mm-hmm. with all these stem cells and young blood and all this her, she was so ridiculously healthy during her pregnancy, so much more so than before or after. Mm. Not to say she's unhealthy. It's just there was like uh, – it was like she was had superpowers or something. It's kind of evolution's um, get out of jail free pass, you know? Yeah. We've, we've, seen, we've seen different indicators of that. Wow, we could do an entire series of episodes on the stuff that we – as a species, don't yet fully understand about pregnancy. Oh, yeah. But what if the idea of being a chimera, what if chimericism doesn't stop there? Chimericism is a word that I just made up. I accept it. Thank you. Uh, What if breakthroughs in medical technology can enable us to create real-life creatures closer and closer and closer to the monsters described in Greek mythology? What if we could create a melding of various animals or even some sort of human-animal hybrid? Could this be possible? And if so, what would we do? We'll explore this after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. The the answer to the first part of the question is emphatically yes. Not only can we as a species do this, we are already doing this. This is already happening. Pandora's jar is twisted open (laughs) and there is no twisting it back. Oh, yeah. We're, We're heading towards land of the centaurs, everybody. Just if we take it back to mythology. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, really think about it. Humans in our storytelling, in our legends, we've been pretty obsessed with humans and animals becoming one thing. If you think about think about werewolves, mm-hmm. think about uh, the skinwalkers, like the version of skinwalker, though it's a little different sure. thing. Or, or a selkie. Oh, yeah. You know, or... Uh, mermaids. Were, mermaids, perfect. Wear jaguar. Uh, there, there are so many stories of people through one means or another. Um, <laughs> weirdly enough, it wasn't evil for a long time. It just became evil later. But through one means or another, people acquiring the attributes of different animals, if not the ability to completely become those animals. Yeah, for either advantageous means mm-hmm. or perhaps because they were – um, cursed in some way. Right. Some sort of divine intervention mm-hmm. is usually how it starts. This obsession carried on for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, in an earlier episode, oh, I don't know how long ago now, Matt, uh, you and I explored the strange true story of the so-called human Z. Do you remember that? I do. Was this a Soviet experiment back <laughs> in the day? <laughs> yes. But it was it – was, I can't remember if we decided it was proven or not. I know for sure that there were a ton of rumors. I think the big question back in the day was, was this propaganda of some sort from either side? Yeah. Um, But there appeared at least on the surface to be experiments in the Soviet Union to create a human-chimpanzee hybrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Ilya Ivanovich 
Ivanov in the 1920s, the idea was that one could combine the intelligence or at least the potential for intelligence of the human being with the physical prowess of a primate. And they said, well, out of all the great apes, the chimp is the closest that we can find to the human. So let's get them together, play some R&B, you know, light some candles, put on some Sade, see what happens. <laughs> and, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Uh, solely because Sade was not around in the 1920s. Oh, Sade was the only part of that? Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, they, they just didn't have the music right. And you Got guys, it. That plays a huge role. Just put uh, on that new Swift album, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> so as far as we know, officially, these experiments during this time did not reach success. There was not a viable offspring. And there will be, you know, there are other reports of, there was the one ape that had lost some of its hair on, on yeah. its head uh, that exhibited human characteristics according to its observers. Hmm. But none of those, none of, none of those experiments, none of those creatures so far as we know created a viable a viable example. Oh, that's right. It was a chimp called Oliver, a chimpanzee ah, called Oliver. That's ringing bells. Yeah, brought to brought to the U.S. who people said he had a human-like appearance, ability to walk upright, and would rather hang out with humans uh, versus chimps. But uh, genetic testing confirmed he was a chimpanzee. And look, chimpanzees are incredibly intelligent. Yeah. Very, very smart. Don't mess with them. Don't try to outsmart them. Don't definitely don't piss them off. Uh, in in Oliver's case, this chimpanzee was probably just very highly acclimated to humans, right? Had yeah. been raised with them, and this you know this is its own unethical, sad thing. But long story short, unless there is a huge secret uh, in terms of Soviet hybridization experiments. We as a species haven't seen a successful version of this. However, that doesn't mean we stopped trying. You see, as it turns out, fellow conspiracy realists, scientists across the planet have not only continued these experiments, they have made striking breathtaking forays into this world of human-animal hybridization. We found several strange, and again, we cannot emphasize this enough, real, genuine, actual examples of chimera being created today. Oh, yeah. So let's just jump through some of these. The first one, it's an attempt to make an increasingly intelligent ape or monkey in this case of some sort. So there are some researchers in both China and the United States that have attempted to create uh, a version of a monkey that also carries a human gene. And this particular gene plays a role in the development of the brain. Mm -hmm. And there's a study, as according to this study that was published in Beijing's National Science Review, uh, there, it, this all occurred when researchers from the Kunming Institute of Zoology. This is a Chinese Academy of Sciences, as, and they were working along with the University of North Carolina and some other institutions. They reported that there were 11 transgenic, this is what they're called, transgenic rhesus monkeys mm -hmm. uh, that, that were created through the, the studies here. And that's pretty, that's pretty intense that we were already creating something like this. Before working on this episode, Personally, I had no idea that there was already some kind of chimeric testing done to create an intelligent animal. That had been allowed to survive, yes. right, to be born, because a lot of the experimentation that we have read about or we have encountered occurs at the embryo stage, embryonic stage. Just And it's mostly to see if it would be possible to then take that you know, creature to term. Mm -hmm. Like if we were going to, we could. This would be a viable specimen. Right, right. But then for insert ethical consideration A through Z here, we are going to terminate the growth of this this bundle of cells and do it before, you know, before organs form and, mm -hmm. and like a brain stem and a nervous system forms and so on. And that's the attempt to to circumvent the ethical quandaries that yes. might occur if, if it's allowed to reach a later stage of development. 
Yes, specifically what they did with these 11 rhesus monkeys is they they gave them human copies of a gene called MCPH1. MCPH1, as you said, Matt, plays a, plays a big role in brain development. And two startling things happened here. According to this study, this small change, this little bit of extra cognitive gas, did make a discernible difference. The monkeys that carried the human copy of this gene exhibited better short-term memory. They also had faster reaction time when compared with a control group of wild rhesus monkeys who had not had uh, their skull hoods tampered with, right? Wow. Well, it's interesting to, if you delve deep into the research and all the documentation and that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. it makes you wonder how much just keeping them as not wild rhesus monkeys, if that that had any effect. That's a great point. Yeah, is it the Oliver effect, right? Mm. We'll just we'll just call it that. Here's the startling thing, though. You said there were eleven monkeys, right? Yes. Who had this gene transferred to them? These eleven monkeys were not created all in one go. Eight of these monkeys were first generation. The other three were second generation. Whoa. Meaning that this trait transferred. Yeah. Which, of course, is how genes are supposed to work. But still, knowing that that's even possible, all you really have to do is create one chimera. And then you could have – you could have endless offspring depending on which species you're using and how long. Uh, All you you need is time and a mate. You are entering another dimension. Yeah, so there you have it. Real life super monkeys with some strong air quotes around there. But – the story doesn't stop there. We, all, we had this in our notes as piggy people, question mark. Yeah. Uh, I know that a lot of us listening today are huge fans of Animal Farm, right, and the work of George Orwell. And there is a incredibly bleak, incredibly well-written part of that book where the animals that – well, quick spoiler, Animal Farm – If you are not familiar with the plot and you don't want it spoiled for you and you've been waiting for a chance to read it or watch one of the mini adaptations, please consider this your spoiler warning. Three, two, two, one. Spoilers. All right. So in Animal Farm, the human owners of the farm or the human uh, authority figures of the farm uh, are, are kicked out of power, right? And the animals in the farm attempt to create a utopian society wherein individuals contribute according to their ability and are supported according to their need, right? Yeah. Sounds great on paper. Anyway, it turns out that the pigs on the farm supplant the former role of the humans and they are real pills. They're bad. (laughs) <laughs> and they betray well, all their all their ideals. Well, and it, as it turns out, genetically, it's an interesting story too, because mm-hmm. humans and pigs are close enough on that mammalian scale, where you know the the what is the term long pig? Yes, to describe a human mm-hmm. uh, in certain ways when consumed. When consumed, yeah, we really aren't that different. No, no, no. And pigs themselves outside of Orwell are quite intelligent. There's this very bleak moving segment of Animal Farm. I'm sure a lot of us already know what I'm going to say, where the surviving animals on the farm are looking from the humans to the pigs and back and forth, and they cannot tell the difference. So this is is a comment, of course – Orwell means it to be a comment on the cycles of supplanting and replacing power structures and, uh, you know, how the... The dangers of gaining power, really. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's also, to what you say, Matt, it's a very interesting comment on the <laughs> the biological <laughs> similarities. Uh, so some people, maybe not inspired by Orwell, maybe very much inspired by Orwell. They probably Uh, read it. Almost certainly they read it in school. Almost certainly they had to. Uh, They decided to see whether it was possible to leverage the biological similarities between the pig and the human uh, to create chimera for a very specific purpose. Based on 
multiple interviews, the MIT Technology Review estimated that in 2015, there were about 20 pregnancies of pig-human or sheep-human chimera. And again, they're not the, – these aren't being born out, right? Yeah. As far as we know. Uh, we know that these come with a very specific goal attached to them, a chimera of – pig and human, a porcine human chimera, or the same product with sheep and humans are attractive because pigs and sheep both have organs that are about the right size for a human, ballpark right size for transplantation into a human being. And if you can get the human cells in there to grow a human liver in particular inside one of these creatures, then, Mm -hmm. well, there you go. You've got an organ factory, my friend. Mm -hmm. You do. You do. Not a perfect organ factory for a number of reasons. Yeah. But this is, again, just the beginning. Immediate questions, right? Skirt, immediate questions. (laughs) Why have we not seen grown-up hybrids yet? Well, first, the ratio of human to animal cells in this sort of creature is very, very low. We're not at the point of porcine people yet. We are, we're, not, we're not reaching peak pig people. Peak pig people. There we go. Uh, we are instead seeing things that would look exactly like a pig or a monkey or a, or a sheep, uh, but their internal ratio is is what changes. So there is a – And it's really just a few genes. It's just a few genes. Been altered. Just a tweak. Just mm-hmm. a tweak. Matt and I are both like holding our yeah. <laughs> pointer fingers and our thumbs mere centimeters from each other and then just sort of twisting in the air. Yeah. Just a little. Just it's a little. It's a little genetic screwdriver, eh? Yeah, well, yeah there we go. What could go wrong? Uh, second – as as I think you said earlier, Matt, in most cases, these hybrids have never been allowed to develop for more than a few weeks. They've been terminated before actual organs, um, nervous systems, and so on have been given the chance to form. So uh, when one expert put it thusly, they said, you know, we're, we're essentially just creating groups of cells to see whether they can work together, coexist, mm-hmm. and then we're – ending them before anything gets uh, into that murky ethical quagmire. Yeah, it's not – it's only in approaching the dark gray area if, you know, you only get them a couple – like a week or two. Further, I say, further into the darkness, uh, you may have uh, had your ears pricked up a bit when you heard the concept of organ production. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. And one of the big things we're we're going to be really postulating or, or having thought experiments about a little later in the show, just to give you a heads up, is why do these things? Why continue down these pathways? And as before the ad break, we talked about the organs are important. Human organs are important. There are not enough uh, human organs to be transplanted for the needs of the humans on the earth right now. And if yeah. we can make more, let's do it. Let's find a way. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, man. I was just – I'm smirking like that because halfway through I got this this very vivid image of church organs. And yeah. someone saying there are not enough church organs. Well, absolutely not. But but to be clear, you're, you're, ta- you're making an incredibly – Incredibly important point about things like hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, yeah. eyes. There are people all over this planet right now that need a transplant that cannot get one. Mm-hmm. Or they're on a list and they have to just wait and hopefully they will live long enough to see that. Uh, you know, Organ transplantation is a miracle of sorts of modern science and uh, I don't think we can downplay that. Yeah, just like we spoke about with the bone marrow transplants. That I mean, Who, who imagined that that – could happen a couple hundred years ago. There's no way. Um, But now we are at a place where we can do that. We just need the organs. So let's jump to 2019, July in particular. Mm. According to two places that we looked at, both the academic journal Nature as well as the Ontario Canada paper National Post, 
Apparently, in July this year, a professor working with the Institute of Medical Science with the University of Tokyo and the Department of Genetics at Stanford University, this professor received approval to begin inserting, quote, human stem cells into rodents in an attempt to grow a human pancreas in the animal. Finally. Okay. Great. We're, we're moving forward to do this, right? It, though it is not as easy both in practice to make it happen mm. and it's also not uh, as easy to get approval for something like this. Right. However, there is precedent because earlier experiments have shown the ability to grow um, – to to grow rat mouse chimera. Yes. So we know that, and th- some of those have been allowed to to live. Yeah, exactly. So you may think, okay, well, why is this news? It's July of 2019. This stuff's already been happening. We've probably you may have seen something in one of these magazines, like Scientific American sure, or something Popular like that. Science or exactly. Something. Where yeah. where over the past ten years or so, these things have been discussed. Well, here's where we get into all this stuff. Um, Because approval for this experiment, it's headed by uh, a man named Hiromitsu Nakauchi. Uh, Approval for the experiment came from a group of scientists who were working directly with the Japanese government, okay? And in years past, the Japanese government had limited the, quote, creation and experimentation of animal embryos imbued with human cells uh, to be only 14 days. So they're only allowed to live for 14 days before I I guess you have to terminate them. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, in March of this year, the Japanese government announced that that 14-day window for testing is actually going to get expanded and they're going to allow for within certain approved studies for human-animal hybrids to be permitted to be brought to full term. Now, here's where it gets exciting for science, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you can create a hybrid human-rat being that can grow a full pancreas, then that's great, right? That's amazing. But you would have to go to full term and then live and continue to live for that pancreas to develop big enough or long enough or large enough to be usable. But that's actually not the, uh, the end game of this study. This is just a first step. Toward what? Well, first it's going to be mice. He's And we're talking about rats. He got approved to do rats, right? Right. That are quite a bit larger than rats, especially laboratory mice. So he's starting with mice just to make sure that it'll work. Then his group is moving on to rats. And then eventually they're moving on up to pigs. And pigs is kind of the end game for this experiment because that is how they're going to be able to successfully grow, um, you know, a pancreas or whatever other organ at the correct size. Right. Okay. Yeah, this makes sense because previously they've been able to grow the pancreas for a mouse inside of a rat and they used islet cells to cure diabetes in mice. This then becomes – uh, a, a series of steps, right? They're progressively building up and hopefully learning mistakes, making errors at the uh, less damaging stages of the process, right? Yeah, exactly. But eventually the man pig is what they're going for. Pig person. The pig person. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Gosh. The... I don't know. Man pig has a ring to it though. <laughs> Surely that's well, a – is that a superhero well, yet? No, you just throw a bear in there and then you've really got something That's going. what I'm thinking of. That's what I'm thinking of. Man bear pig from South, South Park. Yes. I'm so surreal. Man pig. Ah, oh, sorry. I've got these weird images of like – What's the difference between man pig and a pig man? Is it like man bat and Batman? Mm. Is one of them uh, uh, a very wealthy dude in in a strange costume, and the, the other, other one's would... just yelling to kill me, <laughs> kill me? <laughs> God, yeah. uh, I, I feel highly in- insensitive to uh, a lot of this stuff. I'm, I apologize to you, Ben. I apologize to everyone, especially you, Paul. Uh, Yeah, I I think Paul back in 2017 said he would never forgive us, and I think he's holding to that. Paul, are you holding to that? Never forgive, always forget. Yeah, he nodded solemnly. We are still in the doghouse with that guy, still in the pig man, man pig doghouse. This is getting complicated, but the science here is important because one of the 
huge factors holding this sort of experimentation back is not a matter of technical expertise, nor is it a matter of um, possessing the correct technology. Instead, it is a matter of ethics. Exactly. And one of the biggest issues here is let's say you're manipulating the genes in eventually a pig within this study we've been referencing. Sure, or a sheep or whatever. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, in another animal and you're generally manipulating genes that are going to allow to create organs that are human, right? How do you prevent it from affecting the genes that are going to affect um, brain development mm -hmm. or intelligence mm -hmm. because these animals, whether you want to believe it or like it or not, they are experiments. They are subjects of an experiment and they will be terminated most likely at some point, even if, even if it's completely successful and they do grow a pancreas, that, that animal will be terminated most likely in order to get that pancreas. Right. Exactly. And if it's intelligent, if it can understand what's occurring because it's been imbued with human genes that have allowed for different brain growth, mm -hmm. uh, that's where that's where things get really um, just complicated. Right, father, what is my purpose? Yeah, <laughs> why, why you, big child, you're my replacement liver yeah. because I'll be damned if I stop drinking. Well, yeah, then you get into the ethical issues of. Does does this creature deserve rights of some sort or are we dealing with human experimentation at that point? How – what percentage of human experimentation is occurring right now? Right, right, right. Uh, where is the tipping point genetically? Does it need to be defined? Is an animal still – uh, for legal purposes, an animal not deserving of rights if it is only 48 percent human, right? God. And then it hits 51 and it's like, oh, now you can vote. Uh. Vote your conscience. Yeah, I mean this is clearly that's – a, that's a made-up experiment there. Uh, but it is, it is intensely problematic and it does lead into stuff they don't want you to know, they being private institutions funding this research, uh, they being state actors that are playing fast and loose with international conventions on how, how to conduct experiments, right? There's, there's a very interesting point that you raised off air, Matt, that we should explore before we, we continue here. And that is, let's say these things do happen. More creatures get drawn into these experiments. What will they be used for? Mm. First, obviously, organs, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what we keep talking about. It's just – it's the thing we've been attempting to do – uh, as humans for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a huge business that is on both sides of the law. Imagine how many people, if we want to assume the, uh, the utopian vision of the future, if we want to be super optimistic about this, just imagine how many millions of people could have their lives saved if medical researchers are able to grow bespoke or custom replacement organs. Why would you languish for years on a recipient waiting list when a creature with the perfect liver for you could be grown and mature and then harvested and have that liver transplanted within a matter of months. It seems pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. But you you get into the the questions that arise when you're talking about cloning, right? Right, because technically speaking – in theory, it is possible for you and for Paul and I and all of us listening to have a clone of ourselves grown, right? Do some uh, – do some sort of very Dr. Frankenstein-esque stuff to prevent a brain from uh, forming or coming into the equation and then just have your spare set of organs, right? Yeah. Expensive to maintain but uh, at what price – at what price of mortality? You know, yeah, and what you know does that clone deserve any kind of rights? Uh, we... So the aim here would ultimately be the ability to grow replacement organs for almost every single original organ in a human body, minus, of course, one would assume the brain. Maybe I don't. You know, I don't know. I, I was thinking about this too. Like, if 
if it were possible or if it would ever be possible for certain parts of the brain to be replaced, which gets us into that ship of thesis experiment and problem mm -hmm. very quickly. I mean, I, you know, obviously, and uh, our pal Damian Williams love this, obviously we're already reaching a point where we have to redefine what is considered consciousness Certainly. in general. Um, but I, I wondered when, when we were looking at this, Matt, I wondered if there would ever be someone who just to be edgy, you know, 50 years in the future or something says, my body's fine, but I want a brain transplant. Just grow a new brain and put it in this thing and then, you know, just make sure that's me. That's insane. I don't think it would, I don't, I don't see it working unless we had some way to, that sounds insane just to say it, unless we had some way to replicate the synaptic actions and the neurochemical processes that function as the fingerprint of consciousness. If I mean, if that is truly what the fingerprint of consciousness right. yes, is, good right? Point. Yes, yes, <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. But I do think at some point we'll be able to have some kind of technology that maps a brain so fully at such a such a minute level that we can at least print physically what what that thing looks like. Mm -hmm. But whether or not it contains memories and experience and knowledge, uh, we'll it's, find out. Yeah, that's that's one thing that's fascinating, right? Because now we, we at the top of the show said we would bracket the conversation about the soul, but it inevitably creeps in, doesn't it? Because now we're, we're saying that um, if consciousness or if sentience for each individual is something more than what can be mapped in that one specific organ in the human body, then just futzing around with that one organ, uh, it's it's a lot like yeah, I mean you're just fixing part of the system. It's it's kind of like saying um, okay, let's say let's say the brain is just hardware right? Hardware that processes electricity, like a computer. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you can take apart the hardware. You can replace the motherboard or the graphics processor or something. But uh, if you don't have anything to plug it in to, that change does not matter. It is nil. It is, the difference is nil. The problem is moot. So maybe... Got to get an OS in there, man. <laughs> right. Yeah, an OS. Sure. Uh, perhaps that is perhaps that is something approaching, you know, the seed of God or, you know, the electricity that comes when you plug it into an outlet. Or the Matrix. Or the Matrix. Or the Matrix. Yes. Maybe that is what uh, Volume 4 is about, right? Uh, that's what it is. <laughs> Matrix Volume 4, the hard intelligence problem. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, there's there's another experiment too. While we're talking about the brain, this is another use, um, a possible use for hybrids. There are many, many experiments, especially experiments involving cognition, that we cannot legally and officially conduct because – we would have to be humans experimenting on other humans. So Alzheimer's research, right, is a huge field and there's a lot of potential for improvement. And Alzheimer's is, as anyone can attest, a debilitating, tragic condition. When we make models of the decay involved in Alzheimer's, we could potentially make much more robust much more helpful models if we used the brains of human monkey hybrids. Ah, uh, but we would have to allow them to decay n so many times yeah. uh, with so many, you know, subjects that, to get that robust model. That's what you mean? Right. We could create other brain disease models where it's possible to allow a condition to progress beyond what would be ethical or legal to do with a full human being. And even there, isn't that sticky? Isn't that yeah. already – doesn't that already make you feel kind of gross, the fact that we had to say full human? Yeah. Because what 
Everything we have learned about our species throughout the span of recorded history, everything we have learned indicates that we're really starting to to screw up when we start referring to any part of a population as full human versus something else. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So maybe we as a species simply don't have the philosophical or ethical chops to address this. And that goes to our concerns, right? James McDonald, writing for JSTOR Daily, phrases this in a, in a succinct fashion. He says, in many ways, the ethical concerns are thornier than the technical aspects. Direct transfer of tissue between animals and humans raises concerns about animal diseases crossing over to humans, potentially threatening a large population. Okay, I can see that. I can see that. Absolutely. Another concern, he says, is that animals developing with human cells might somehow develop human physical or mental characteristics. The idea of, say, a pig with a human mind being used as an organ donor is horrifying. Agreed. Agreed. Luckily, so far as we know, this human mind development probably would not happen by accident. Emphasis on probably, which bothers me. I don't know about you, but... Most certainly. Yeah, but McDonald says, even if human tissue somehow migrated to an animal's developing brain, it would still probably develop as animal brain tissue. But is probably enough. Yeah. No. I don't don't think think so. so. (laughs) You don't think so, but your kidneys are fine. I know, exactly. I don't don't have a pressing – well, that's not true. I have – there are members in my family that right now need a heart. I have – I have – I'm thinking of a person in particular that needs a heart transplant or his – you know, his life will be cut short almost certainly. So having this, if we had access to this, I would have to – I – I would have to advocate for it. It's sort of like um, at various times in in the course of stem cell research, uh, politicians who are very much against it for usually for re-election or election purposes. For anything. Yeah. They they pulled a 180 when they realized it could help a loved one. Yeah. Or just they have that uh, one degree of separation with somebody who it is fully impacting, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen that over and over and over. It, it, with again, with any issue. Absolutely. And so now we end in media rests. We end in the middle of the story. And we have to ask ourselves and ask you as well, what next? Again, here is the situation as it stands. Barring some global catastrophe, experimentation in this field will continue because the possible potential benefits are just too impressive. They're too uh, too much of a beneficial paradigm shift. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't even gotten into some of the other really out there ideas about what this could be or mean. Barely touched it. Super soldiers, possibility. Well, yeah. Super soldiers or super spies. Because imagine if if you could have a cat-human hybrid that looks just like a cat but has the intelligence of a human and can communicate in some way. And it's just spying on, you know, whatever house, like maybe it's in your house. You know what I mean? cool. I mean, think about that. I don't, I have cats. I don't trust them. (laughs) Nor should you. Ask anybody, ask anybody who has a cat as a companion. (laughs) Don't trust them. I love them. Just don't trust them. I think that's the most prejudiced thing I've ever said, and I 100% (laughs) stand behind it. I love the animals that live with me. I do not trust them. That's what dogs are for. They're already too smart. I mean, if we're if we're going to make a hybrid, it's that's dangerous. Uh, you know, did, didn't we talk about how U.S. intelligence agencies tried to make cyber cats before? Yeah, yeah. and then also uh, cats domesticated themselves, right? They, oh. you know, you ever look at a pug and you think, dang, that could have been a wolf. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cats did not undergo that same sort of uh, eugenic practice. They just showed up. They're like, y'all have food. Mm -hmm. Give me more of that food. Yeah, they said they'd solve the rat problem, and they kind of did in a lot of cases, but then they didn't leave. You know what I mean? They solved the hard rat problem. They solved the hard rat problem. But uh, speaking of solving hard problems— We're faced with a geopolitical dilemma here, too, because countries and institutions that enforce ethical conventions in this regard may end up falling behind. We're already seeing this sort of splintering 
of um, of experimental heft and uh, and location of the pioneering research because these experiments are happening. You know, the more extreme ones are happening in countries where it's a little easier to bend certain regulations. Well, well we're talking about Japan, and you know that one in particular. You're not necessarily – it doesn't strike me as a country that would bend these rules too much unless, of course, you go back to World War II and Unit 731 and some of that kind of experimentation. But it's such a different – Yeah, you're absolutely right, Matt. I was I was specifically thinking of China, but already the different scientific communities of the country of China or places based there are – raising hell with objections to what they see as lax ethical regulations and, and so on. There have been a number of notable experiments in the past years that have pushed the envelope there to various uh, extreme degrees. Mm. The, the, thing, the thing that we'll run into here is that private entities that are state-sponsored can make enormous progress on this and it becomes scary when we realize that uh, right now, there's very strong potential for this, yeah. right? But there's not provable precedent yet. As soon as provable precedent exists, something that can be reproduced with, let's say, gosh, even a 70, 80 percent chance of success, then people and institutions will – rethink whatever existing ethical considerations they have because then it becomes a question of what do you place what, – what, what is higher on your list of important things? Your moral code or your ability to live to see tomorrow? Ability to live to see tomorrow as well as creating a viable business plan. True. Oh my gosh, even worse. Yes. Uh, so – what what we'll see is going to be going to be darkly fascinating. The, there will either be a sea change in the way we approach ethical concerns of the past, or quite possibly there will be very well funded secret programs. I don't know how long they would be able to remain secret. Well, I mean, we, we've already kind of covered this before, especially when we were talking with Josh Clark about his show, The End of the World, mm -hmm. the experimentation that's going on in small labs that are just, you know, you pay for the time, nobody asks any questions, you do your experimentation. That's occurring across the world, especially in the United States. True. And if you have an outfit that is working on something and you're being successful at it and nobody is checking or approving your experiments – as, mm. Yeah, especially in this environment where uh, certain things are – certain things like genes or uh, the technology applying genes is, is allowed to be patented. And that comes troublingly close to a private entity being able to own, for lack of a better word, an entire form of life. Yeah. So imagine, you know – Imagine it's not just uh, pig people or man no. pig. It's uh, Comcast pig people. Oh. Pig people powered by Comcast. And they represent X number of viewers every week Who, they, on the subscribers. You know, I just picked Comcast because they, they have a monopoly in certain parts of the U.S. Uh, I don't think they're in the Chimera game yet. Dude, I gosh, I just had a really dark vision of – uh, web bots, you know, and, and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. But in this case, it's some some company that has patented a certain human type or a, hu a version of a human where they just mass produce them and put them in housing somewhere and then attach them to the television so they can have a certain number of viewers <laughs> for every episode of whatever thing it is. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that would not make any sense. But do their their <laughs> rights count? I don't know. Well, uh, let let us know what you think. So long and short of it is that something like this is inevitable because, again, the potential benefits are just too good for yeah. anyone to really walk away. But will this end up being a dystopian nightmare? Will this end up being the utopian answer to – uh, so many problems today, 
Or is the answer, as it so often is, somewhere disappointingly in between those two goalposts? Where it ends up being a great opportunity for anyone with a lot of money to get a great organ, but for everybody else, eh. Or even worse, look at the way medicine works in many countries, especially in the U.S. now. Imagine that you are able to buy, let's say, a replacement uh, kidney or something Mm -hmm. that that you need to live, Uh, but – because it is privatized, you are required to, you know, you're essentially renting or making, you have an organ mortgage. That's going to happen. Organ mortgages. Uh, I know. And it sounds like if you didn't speak English, organ mortgage sounds like a, a, a pretty cool phrase. It really does. But in the end, it just means a lot of money coming out of your paycheck every month. And then what happens if you can't pay? Uh, the bank buys your organ. Right. Right. Or just gets your organ, and then do they decide how you how you concentrate your labor to pay them back? Mm. Tricky, tricky, tricky stuff. Let us know. You can uh, you can contact us directly. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Please do check out our group page. Here's where it gets crazy. Say hi to our favorite part of the show, you and your fellow listeners, as well as our super mods. All you have to do to join is know who hosts this show. Remember, my name's Matt. That guy's usually Noel. They call him Ben. You're you. So remember, you kind of host the show too. That's Mission Control. Yeah, that's Mission Control. And uh, any other super producer that rolls our way, name them. Come on in. You don't, right. You only have to name one or two or whatever. Honestly, just... Just between us. I mean, don't tell anyone else I said this, but if you can make us laugh, you're probably in. Oh, yeah. Please. Well, <laughs> welcome to you of good – you of good humor. Hey, Matt, what if people hate the social meads? If people hate the social meads, well, then I applaud you and uh, join me somewhere on the streets of Atlanta and we will we'll chat. Uh, <laughs> and ben, ben, too, obviously. Just head on over to a dive bar near Pond City Market. You'll find us. <laughs> you can also call us. We have a phone number where you have three minutes to say whatever is on your mind. All we ask is that if you do not want this message to be aired, yes, let us know in the message. Or if you want your voice to be, you want to be on the air, but you want your voice to be changed and your name not to be used, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, one 833 S-T-D-W-I-T-K. That's the number. If you don't want to do any of that stuff, you can write to us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.